Welcome to another episode of Tradecraft Tuesday, everybody. Uh, I'm your host, Kyle Hanslovid, followed with my other host, Chris Bisnett. And today we're uh, breaking down a lovely worm that's propagating across the internet. And what's nice about this uh, episode today is typically it's a retrospective. You know, this is what's going on. This is how we've seen it work. But uh, this attack right now is live in the wild. Uh, it started since Friday. And we're going to break that down for you and step by step how this worm started, how it's propagating. Maybe this is a foresight of what we're gonna see with the internet of things. Um, but before we do that, I just wanna remind everybody that Tradecraft Tuesday happens every Tuesday at noon Eastern time. You guys can find us, the easiest way to find us is on Twitter, at Tradecraft Tuesday. that's Tuesday without the day. Um, and every episode we begin with just some real quick news. So uh, Chris, I'll turn it over to you and let you jump into that. Actually, this week we have no news. <laughs> no news? Well, you no, know. No, I spent, I spent all my time looking at all these scripts and trying to figure out exactly how this virus is, or this worm is propagating and how it works and stuff. So I, I didn't have time to collect any news. Um, but I guess the news is if you have Ubiquity devices, uh, upgrade, patch them, and uh, remove this malware from your devices. Yeah, no, that, that's a good point. And I, I guess in our intro, I didn't ex exactly explain what it is, but specifically... There has been a vulnerability in uh, a couple Ubiquiti Air Max wireless devices. Right. Uh, unfortunately, that uh, patch has been released about a year ago, and it appears that a vast majority of users have not applied the patch, hence the reason that this worm has been able to spread. Actually, I don't think this particular vulnerability um, was patched a year ago. It looks like it was patched in like February or something. Okay. Okay. Well, we'll definitely uh, post some of that on the timeline. Maybe it was, uh, was this one July? I well, think you know what the embargo I think ended in February or something like that. There was something. something yeah, so the patch that. came out on July 17th. We'll jump through that in a little bit later. Um, but how about Chris for folks who have no clue what we're talking about? Um, I guess what why we would call this even under Internet of Things, or what is different between a worm and yeah. any other virus? Well, but let me real quick before we before we get into that, I want to preface this with um, with a disclaimer that. Uh, there will be some cursing in this episode, um, not because we just feel like cursing, but because uh, the malware writers apparently like to curse. And so the names of their files are, are curse words. So if you're listening at work, um, now would probably be a good time to put in headphones or wait till later. Um, <laughs> but with that said, uh, go for it. All righty. So um, right away, <clears throat> I think about... Um, I don't know, maybe the practical malware analysis book that goes through and it breaks down all the different types of malware. And one of the pieces of malware in there is worms. And what's unique about worms is traditionally it's centralized around an exploit that is remotely exploitable uh, with minimal or no user intervention. And typically it's no user intervention at all. And what that does is it allows the virus to self propagate or are, uh, you know, self spread. And that's why they call it a worm, because typically it will go infect one host, do its thing, drop its payload, and then begin looking for new hosts. Um, and this is no new thing. I mean, we've had plenty of worms that have hit, you know, the Internet, I think, since the 70s. Um, Chris, what are some of the most recent ones? I can't think of a good uh, worm that's actually spread across the Internet um, the last couple of years. I mean, I, I think of Code yeah. Red, right? That was early 2000s. Code Red was like 2003. Um, I can't think of anything like recent that was like real successful. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I think it's I think it's gotten a lot harder as the um, the devices on the internet have like uh, diversified. Right, like everybody used to be running PCs with DOS. Now some people run PCs. Some people run Macs. A lot of the devices on the internet are like phones running Android or iOS or, you know, Windows CE and, you know, you got Linux and Windows. And I think there's just so many devices that are different on the internet now that uh, it's like much harder to write like a good worm that will actually propagate, you know, uh, really well. I don't know. Um, it, here's, some, it, here's a question for you, though. Do you remember the first worm and who wrote it? Oh, gosh. I'm guessing late 70s. Yes. Um, I believe it was like sometime around like 78 or something. I don't remember now. I, I don't. The Morris worm, Robert Morris. Oh, I'm terrible. At I, that, was like, that was like the first one. That was like the first look at my O-Day. Pull, pull my cybersecurity card. I clearly know. You're fired. 
Um, okay, so let's let's talk about some uh, like two of the big ones that I really remember. Um, Code Red Worm, you remember that one? I do. Yeah, I definitely remember. That was IAS, if I remember right. Yep. Early two thousand. Code Red Worm was uh, two thousand and one. Um, you were right. It was an IAS vulnerability. I believe it was like a buffer overflow, um, but it didn't need to be authenticated or anything. You basically just sent it a um, a request um, with like a bunch of a really long string, and it would try to copy that into a buffer that wasn't large enough, and you could get remote code execution from that. Um, they estimate that it spread to 359,000 hosts on the internet. Um, and uh, this one was actually not too bad. The, the patch for this vulnerability was released, but it was only, it only been out for like a month. So um, Code Red Worm was interesting because it had uh, three different phases. One phase was like um, searching for other hosts to infect, um, another phase was like infecting hosts. And then the last phase was like sleeping. So I remember for like, gosh, it would have been like a couple of months afterwards where like there were all these like uh, code red worm countdowns and stuff where, you know, people were like going on. Um, I remember uh, watching tech TV and, um, and there was a show on there called the screensavers and stuff. And they would have these code red worm countdowns and they would just be like pleading with people like, please go patch your IIS servers. It's going to start infecting again in like two days. Please go patch, please patch. And, uh, you know, like it was just, it like blew my mind at the time. It was like, wow, I can't believe, like, I can't believe this. Oh boy, that's hilarious. Yeah, I remember, you know, I, I think my very first worm that I was old enough to have to like do a response to across a big internet mm -hmm. uh, or, you know, a, a big enterprise uh, group of computers was, Blaster and Welchia. And what was neat about that one is Blaster was, you know, making its way across the Windows uh, network. And then someone released uh, the nematode virus, which was mm -hmm. Welchia, which was exploiting the same vuln, but essentially trying to combat, uh, combat Blaster. It was, right. it was wild. Right. Yeah, that, that, those are the most interesting ones where somebody tries to write a helpful worm that actually then, like, patches the original vulnerability. You know, like, those are, those are crazy. Although... Uh, gray area for legality is probably illegal, but now we should touch on that today too. For uh, as we start exploring how this actually started working with the, um, you know, the Air Max phone and the Ubiquity devices, right? Because I think this is right. You know, there's probably no reason that somebody couldn't do this. Yeah. Um, I, I won't give too much away as we as we deep dive into yeah. this thing. So, so the other big one that I wanted to touch on was um, SQL Slammer which was uh, another buffer overflow, but this time in Microsoft SQL Server. Um, and, but this one was fast. There was no delays in the sleeping. Um, and the crazy part was you, it, it was exploited over a UDP packet. So there was no need to set up a whole three-way handshake. So it was basically just like shoot the packet and forget, and they would just send packets as fast as they could. Um, and in about 10 minutes time, they estimate that it spread to like basically 100% of people who were vulnerable which was like 75,000 people. But Gosh, the problem was they were all generating so much traffic that like the entire internet started to crawl. And I, I think I remember seeing a report that actually said um, South Korea dropped off the internet because <laughs> like, you know, just like the way they had like set up their infrastructure, there were a couple of choke points and they were just oversaturated and, and nothing could get through. Oh, that's, that's crazy. So, uh, you know, in hindsight, what I think I pulled away from this is you need a re remotely exploitable, you know, uh, vulnerability. Yep. Um, it sounds like the easier to exploit, the better, or the more reliable. Um, and then obviously you need a, a boatload of internet connected hosts that you can reach. Yep. So that, that probably explains why this vulnerability we're talking about, which are like wireless access points, wireless routers right. uh, that are directly internet connected are right for this type of worm. Right. Yeah, so for anybody not familiar, um, what we're talking about here are uh, Ubiquity devices. Um, and there's a couple of different series that uh, the company Ubiquity Networks produces. Um, you know, they have, they have lots of different things like um, uh, air beams, um, and they have some, have some like big devices, but mostly these are for um, like enterprise grade. So if you ran like a college campus, or um, a large campus, uh, you know, where maybe you've got a couple of different office buildings and you want them all connected, you want people to be able to walk from building to building and maintain Wi-Fi, or maybe you run like a wireless internet service provider. These are probably going to be devices you're using um, to do this. That's really their market. That's what they're geared towards. 
Uh, so this vulnerability affects Air Max and specifically um, uh, their software called Air OS. There is a slightly different um, uh, product line called Unify. And uh, as of right now, those don't appear to be vulnerable. They have a slightly different firmware and stuff, but um, I haven't looked into it, so they may, they may actually be vulnerable. I don't know. So uh, you want to jump into the timeline, Chris, yeah. on, um, you know, on, on how this happened? I think what was neat about this one is, um, for those not familiar with bug bounties, the idea behind it is a company wants to know about their vulnerabilities to be able to provide better quality software, more secure software. So they work with you know one of many providers and they say, hey, we want you to help orchestrate our bug bounty collection. So right. you find a vulnerability in our device, we're going to rate you know how complex or how dangerous this could be to the community. We're going to take it, patch it, and we're going to reward you with some cash. So this right. is one of those. You know, Ubi Ubiquity was doing the right thing with their bug bounty program. And uh, I think this is submitted on the 1st of July, 2015, from what I've seen. And I'm going to paste a link to it right now. Um, yep. Yep. So that just went there in the live chat window. Yeah, so somebody basically reported this bug to uh, to HackerOne, and, and HackerOne acts as kind of like uh, the middleman slash platform um, for a bunch of different vendors, and Ubiquity is one of them. So um, Ubiquity gets the report. They then vet it, determine if the bug is a real bug or not a real bug, um, and then they begin like trying to patch it and, um, and, and, and release you know new versions of firmware and stuff. And then they rewarded, in this case, they rewarded the whoever the researcher is um, with $18,000. So I'm not sure who the researcher is. The, their username is a bunch of random characters, probably because they don't want um, you know, anyone to know who they are, um, maybe because uh, you know, they, they have other reasons not to be known. But um, this, this person submitted a couple of different bugs, um, but this one was by far the uh, most, I guess... Valuable Dangerous. one, yeah, sure, yeah. yeah. The reason I think the other bugs they uh, they paid him out were hundred, two hundred, five hundred dollars. Right. This one was eighteen thousand dollars. So that's a great example of right. just the difference. Um, and what's neat about it though, Ubiquity. I, I went and actually read the blog and kind of followed where the patch report came out, mm -hmm. and they uh, they dropped a a blog and a patch uh, seventeen days or sixteen days after the initial bug report. And I don't know if there was correlation before. Um, but I think that's a great response from any, any provider of uh, technology, especially Internet of Things technology, to say, here you go, guys. Here's your patch. Right. Uh, it's going to fix this issue. And I think they realized real quick that this issue was going to be a bad one. Um, yeah. you know, we mentioned they paid them $18,000. Um, and what happens with a lot of these bug bounties is you go under an agreement with the company that, I am not going to disclose the specific techniques that I use to accomplish this bug for a certain amount of time. And the idea, right, it's kind of like, uh, you know, as opposed to full disclosure, it's given enough people to coordinate the patch and enough time for people to patch it to minimize the risk of somebody, you know, weaponizing this and creating a worm like what actually happened. Right. Yeah, I mean, the idea is really they, they want to be able to, the vendor wants to have time to, um, create a patch, test the patch, uh, you know, get it pushed out, and actually have people be able to uh, update their devices. Um, you know, the the key part there is like people have to update their devices. So, um, the the person who originally reported this on the Ubiquity forum was running um, a version of their software, um, five point five point two, which is like two years old. Um, so, I mean, I. I it's hard to come down on either side and say like you have to patch your devices or you shouldn't patch your devices, uh, you know, because people are worried about like oh what if I patch and the patch is bad. Um, case in point, Apple patched, uh, Apple released an update. What was it yesterday? That's uh, bricked some iPads. Um, so, you know, so people are legitimately in some cases wary of patching because what what happens if that's a bad patch? Um, but you know, at some point, you know, maybe give it a week, two weeks. Maybe try it out on one or two devices. If it seems to work, then patch up. Um, you know, you don't want to wait two years to patch. You know, if if anybody out there has Ubiquity devices and and uh, needs some incentive to to patch, go look at the Hacker One list. Go look at the bug reports. 
uh, you know, you'll see pages and pages of bugs that they've paid out on hundred bucks, 500 bucks, thousand, 2000, um, you know, like they're paying out because those are real bugs. So, you know, if you're not updating, there are people out there who know about these bugs. So do we, do we want to jump into the technical side of it? I mean, we have yeah. two different ways, Chris, we can approach it. We can do it with, uh, you know, walk through how the actual user who reported it on the ubiquity forums did, mm. or we could go and start with maybe the, <laughs> the concept code that was published by the author who originally provided the patch. Uh, yeah, we might as well start with a proof of concept that then we can uh, work from there, I guess. All right, so we mentioned on the 1st of July, this thing was, uh, the initial bug submission was received by Hacker One. 17th of July, it's patched. 19th of August, 2015, $18,000 bug bounty paid. And what happens is that began essentially his six month time of cooling off um, or eight month time, however long the NDA was for the guy who disclosed it. However, in true hacker fashion, he said, you know what? It's gone long enough. It's been six plus months. And I just posted a link here that should show up in the, the live chat bar that is a link to the actual exploit BB article. And so he did. He went uh, after it's been patched. He said, hey, I want to go full disclosure. And he kind of exposed just how terrible th th this bug really was. Um, so so one, thing to, one thing to note is like he did this the right way. He actually requested from the vendor to release a blog post and they gave him the AOK. -okay. So, you know, it's, it's not like he was, uh, you know, just going around their backs or anything like they approved this. So Chris, I'm going to do my best to uh, use some of the screen share options if it actually uh, works here. And then, then we can walk through just a, a little bit of the screen share. I noticed that my comment that I threw up in there doesn't appear to show up as well. So for exploit DB here, which one? Oh, in the chat. Yeah, do you see, have you noticed that it's not showing up there? Yeah, I don't see it in there either. For folks that want to join along, since uh, Blab is uh, giving us pain, uh, you could literally just throw in in Google exploit DB and then search the word air OS and you'll probably get it. It's the arbitrary file upload is the one that we're trying to share with you guys. But uh, yeah, I tried, not really I tried pasting it into chat too. It looks like chat is busted or lagging. I'm not sure. All right. Yep. Same thing with screen share. So what we're going to do is we're going to walk through about it. Um, I, I kind of already gave away a little bit arbitrary file upload. And what it boils down to is the Ubiquity device, and Chris, please correct me if I'm wrong, but how I understand it, they had a case that allowed a unauthenticated user, so no user, no password, didn't have to log in. As long as he could make a HTTP request to this device, he was able to essentially drop a file using, was it root admin privileges? Yep, yep. So it'll be, the file will be dropped with the privileges of the running web server, which is root. Gotcha, and, and that's, um, you know, I, I think it was specifically the login uh, CGI script that allowed yep. this to happen. Why the login script ever allowed anybody to post a file and that could get written to disk as root, that's, you know, that's kind of beside the point. It's terrible, but yeah, thank goodness the darn thing's patched. Yeah. Um, but but what happened, Chris? What would you do if I said, hey, you can kind of get a drop a file anywhere you want. Uh, when it comes to embedded devices like this Ubiquiti Air Max device, where would you have gone with it? Um, there's, a, there's a lot of different things you can do. I mean, uh, this is really only half of, uh, of what you need. Right, because you can drop a file, but it doesn't execute the file. It'll just write the file to to disk somewhere. So, um, what you're going to need to be able to do is is get to the second half with it, which is actual code execution. Um, or in this case, they went a little bit trickier um, and they they did something else. So instead of just writing like some binary somewhere and like having to wait for it to be executed, maybe the next time the, the device reboots, they actually went ahead and they uh, they wrote to the authorized keys, um, which for anybody not familiar is what SSH uses um, instead of a password in some cases. So uh, most people are pretty familiar with um, SSH and you enter a username and IP address and it says what's your password, you enter your password and, and you're on. Um, but one of the other ways you can do it when you need to administer a lot of machines is um, you can actually use public private key pairs. So um, you add your public key to a file called the authorized keys um, and then you can tell SSH, hey, connect over SSH and authenticate with my private key. 
um, and then you don't need a password. So that's basically what they've done here is they've added their public key uh, using this arbitrary file upload, and then they can just SSH to the device and uh, do anything they want to. And from there, they can um, you know, download other files, they can execute commands, um, they can do really whatever they want. Nope, nope. And I and for those who are following along what happened on the Twitter feed, I went and actually posted uh, a, you know, a link to that Ubiquiti Air OS. So you can actually see what the simple command looks like. We're talking about a one-line command to be able to uh, push this file up, yep. this authorized keys that Chris was just talking about. Yeah, so, so it's strange that it accepts a file. Um, the real vulnerability here, though, is the directory traversal. So what they, the developers intended was um, receive a file for whatever reason and put it in some directory. Uh, but they really just concatenated the path. So they, had, they maybe had a slash foo slash bar, and then they would add on to it whatever the file name you said. So if you said, I'm uploading, um, you know, good dot text. The idea was the developer wanted it to go to slash foo slash bar slash good dot text. Um, but what you can do on, uh, in this case, is take advantage of um, path traversal techniques. So uh, like dot dot in Linux and Windows, if you run it from the command line, that means, hey, use the parent directory. Uh, so what they were able to do was to say, um, my file is named dot dot slash dot dot slash evil dot text. And then so, um, you know, when the CGI script puts them together, you end up with slash foo slash bar dot dot slash dot dot slash evil dot text. Um, and that basically gets rid of the foo in the bar and you can put your file wherever you want. So Kyle's showing right there, you can see file name equals dot, dot, slash, dot, dot, slash, Etsy drop bear authorized keys. So instead of putting that in a specific folder, they were able to put that in the Etsy folder and modify the authorized keys. And that should never be able to be done. And um, for anybody not familiar, that's called a directory traversal attack. Yep, yep, that, that's perfect. Now I know we had to go uh, old school here and uh, share it with the <laughs> webcam. Um, since folks are not able to chat with us in this chat bar, I'm monitoring the Twitter feed. So if you guys have questions, please hit us up there. Yeah. I will still make, uh, you Sorry know, make that. lemonade out of this. Uh, lemon juice. Hopefully they get some of this stuff sorted out. So before things went down, though, I was able to post, you know, um, the Ubiquity Networks disclosed on Hacker One this file upload. What I also was not able to post, sadly, was you know, the actual first user complaining about that. And it's a great uh, example of something that we could all walk through and actually take a look when he starts complaining about, hey, this is what I'm seeing in real time. We're seeing a guy just on Friday who uh, he claims to be one of the largest wireless internet service providers in Spain and all of his devices are compromised. And yep. so you can literally walk through this blog in real time um, and see how his, dev his devices are being compromised. So I'll throw that here. Chris, you want to, while I'm posting that on our Twitter feed, you want to, uh, you know, kind of walk through that and then people can go along as I post? Yeah, yeah, sure. So um, he didn't really post the files in order. Um, he just kind of posted them as he did. But generally, it's the first couple of posts that uh, we're going to be looking at here, maybe the first, like, six posts. Um, so if you, if you go and look at it now, you'll see his initial post followed immediately by a green highlighted post. Um, that is a post from the Ubiquity staff. Um, and then below that, you'll see his original posts where um, he'll cat out all the files that he found on his device. I'll give you a yeah, second to bring this. that up. So I've posted it to Twitter. Um, for relevant things, I will attempt to share my webcam like we just did. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, all right. To start this off, so um, basically all of these files are going to reside in... Uh, a special directory they have on these ubiquity devices called Etsy persistent, ETC persistent. Um, the idea of this directory is um, you might need to do special things when your um, ubiquity boots up. I have seen people run different scripts to uh, modify things on IP tables and stuff. Um, so any files you really put in Etsy persistent, uh, they'll stick around after the device reboots. So if you put files anywhere else, as soon as the device reboots, they're gone. So this is where you need to put files to stay around, which is why the attackers put their files there. So initially, the infection drops two files. 
Um, one is rc.poststart and the other is mf.tar. So rc.poststart um, is basically a script that uh, the Ubiquity firmware will look for and run if it exists so that, like I was saying before, you could do special things whenever your Ubiquity devices boot up. Maybe you want to adjust IP tables or something. Um, and so the attacker's taking advantage of that to use that as their persistence mechanism. So every time the device reboots, this file will get run again. And uh, all that file does is very simple. It just extracts mf.tar. And then it goes ahead and it runs an extracted script called mother. So the mother script is where some of the interesting stuff happens. This is kind of the setup. Uh, so what it's going to do is it's going to add an account called mother. Uh, so what Kyle's highlighting there, that's the rc.post start. Um, and then the mother script, I believe, is a couple down. Um, and what that's going to do is it's going to add an account as administrator. And the account name is called mother. And it does this by just grepping to see if um, mother exists in Etsy password. And if it doesn't, then it just appends another line to Etsy password, uh, basically to, to create another account called mother with administrator privileges. Um, then the next thing it does, interestingly enough, is it uses IP tables to block access to HTTP and HTTPS. So as an administrator, this is really going to frustrate you because that means you can no longer log into your device through the web UI, and you'll have to SSH or Telnet to it. After it's done, so yeah, go ahead. I, uh, to, to make this somewhat interactive here, I'm going to try to get a webcam in a stable place and go through with you. Do you know where we're looking right now? Um, if you just just search for cat space mother, you'll see it. It's a... Uh, like number nine, if you look at the post in the bottom left hand corner, it'll say like eight of 601, nine of 601. So here is what we're mentioning some of the uh, I'm talking about. You know, username mother. Uh, clearly, password fuck was the best option you could do. Yes. I mean, what other password would you use? You know? All right, Chris. You can keep going, my friend. I will do my best to follow along with you. All right, I think you need to turn it to the left. Turn it to the left a little bit. There you go. There we go. Okay. Uh, which script is that? Oh, I think you're looking at a different one. Are you on 9 of 601? I will go to 9 of 601. Yep. Yeah, so 9 is a script mother, so that's mother. It's hard to read, but um, we'll just push on through. So you can see uh, first is the grep command followed by the echo command. That's modifying IP table or modifying Etsy password to add another user. Um, and then right after that, there's two IP tables commands, which actually blocks access to the web interface. So after that's done, uh, they call a different script that was extracted from the tar archive called uh, download. And it's a super simple script. All it does is uses, um, uses some commands to download curl and download uh, two libraries that curl needs to run. And then those will be used later. Uh, it starts a couple of processes. I think there's like three or four processes to go ahead and search for other devices. Um, and search is pretty crude. Basically, all they do is generate a bunch of IP addresses um, and then call, call a, another script called infect and pass them the IP address. And they just try to infect as many boxes as they can. They don't even care what device it is. Um, so they do that for a while, and then they sleep for a long time. I didn't calculate what the sleep is. It's a bunch of sixes. I don't know how long that sleep is. It's like 666,666 seconds, however long that is. I don't know. And um, after that's done, then they run a script called fucker. Um, I giggle. So... <laughs> so uh, so fucker basically uh, goes through, uh, and it finds the infected devices, and well, it, it fucks them. Um, we'll get into that in a minute. Um, so after that's done, there's another sleep for a, another quite a long time. Um, after that's done, they go ahead and they actually change the configuration to set the SSID of the device to motherfucker. They save the configuration, and then they power off the device. Gotcha. So this uh, thing so, did just what it said. It really hosed this device, right? 
yes. blocking IP yes. tables, just as a recap. It's spawning a couple other processes. It's doing some sleeping. It changes the SID or the SSID to uh, taunt you. And then yeah. in good old fashion, it powers off the device. And why is the powering off the device? Isn't there something important why that matters, Chris? Um, I, I thought for some reason I read on the Ubiquiti devices that the SSID would not uh, replace. Uh, probably, probably not. So one of the things that happens on like power off is that the configuration is saved to persistent storage. Um, obviously, everything's going to be restarted when it comes back up. And uh, there's something else. There's a couple of things that happen, but I, I think really they were just doing that to like mess with people. <laughs> I mean, I mean, there's really not too much malicious here. Um, like, in fact, like they're not trying to like DDoS some site or anything. They're they're really just screwing with everybody's ubiquity routers and, and turning them off and causing people headaches. So, so then, what's the next step, Chris? What goes down after this device powers off? <clears throat> All right. So, uh, well, before before it powers off, when they're searching looking for new hosts, they're going to call the infect script, and the infect script is where most of the interesting stuff happens. This is where they actually use the vulnerability. So they already downloaded curl. Um, for anybody who f finds the, uh, the proof of concept on exploit DB, you'll see that there's a very simple command at the bottom of it that says, you can exploit this just using this simple curl command. And that's exactly what they do. They use curl to push over a bunch of files. Uh, so like I said before, they push over the authorized keys files, they push over the Etsy password file, they, puts over, they push over the mf.tar, which contains basically all of their other scripts. Um, they restart um, SSH. And for every host that they're able to infect, they write the IP address to slash temp slash INF. And the reason that that is important is because uh, the script fucker, well, specifically fuck, uses that. So, so after the box is infected, remember, it's going to do some sleeping. And then at some point, it's going to call a fucker. And fucker, all it does is for every single IP address in that slash temp slash INF file, it's going to go through and call the script fuck on it. And when they call fuck, uh, this, is, this is where they really just, this is where it gets nasty. Uh, they basically log into the device and they factory reset it. So, yeah. They, they really just tried to like build in a bunch of things here to just, screw with anybody running a vulnerable ubiquity device so i'm sure this guy's not the only person i'm sure there's a bunch of people out there having a really bad day um and uh yeah i don't know i don't know what to tell you i guess if you, you just looked keep up with the package. forum there was actually two isps that complained hey, what was there? all our devices you know hey we you know we thought we patched we thought we knew they were up to date but clearly they weren't and uh Oh, definitely a rough day. Yeah. Yep. So, Chris, since we don't have some of the, uh, the, the graphics to support and kind of walk people through the code that we prepared earlier today, um, mm -hmm. I think we can still do a fairly decent way of kind of playing a little bit of devil's advocate here and talking a little bit about maybe what could have been done, what should have been done, what enabled this to happen. Um, yeah. I think there is... Uh, Great testimony today to the the effectiveness of Hacker One's bug bounty submission program. Clearly, they got a great bug that was available. Um, who knows how it would have been delivered before then? So I think kudos to that. That was uh, that was pretty great. On top of it, I think the whatever the six month or eight month NDA that was uh, given out by Ubiquity, I think it was appropriate. Right? If you're not going to patch in six months or eight months, you're probably never going to patch that device. So um, although this is the downfall of not applying the patches, you know, we, we kind of seen some of that. I think it maybe raises the question. I actually, Dan Guido last week on the show mentioned that the new way of patching or going through a more uh, pragmatic way of patching where it's fully maintained and managed by the system provider could be the step to go, especially in Internet things and devices. What are your thoughts on that? You think uh, IoT devices should self-update? Yeah. I mean, I, I think so. You know, uh, you know, you obviously you got to build in some, uh, you know, some protections, right? Like, uh, like I was saying before, the the Apple released an update that was basically soft bricking some devices. But the the thing about that is, they can release a new a new update. You just plug the device in, right, and it's 
good to go. It's not actually dead, right? So you, you got to have some actual, uh, some sort of like basically protection so that you're not pushing out a thing which will actually kill devices and, and you know, users won't be able to log into them. Um, but there's got to be some sort of push and take, I think, right? Like I think, I think maybe there should be like a window where, you know, people who own these devices are notified and said like, hey, look, um, we pushed out a patch, you know, two weeks, you can go ahead and test it out. After two weeks, it's just going to start getting applied. So everywhere, some, right? That gives some type of grace period or something like that. Right. That gives people a little bit of window. So maybe on one or two devices, you know, if you have a hundred of these, you know, add that patch one or two devices, see how they run for the next week. If they run okay, then, you know, then patch them all. Right. If you have, if you have an issue, then you only lost one or two devices. Um, and you know, the, I'm not, no, I don't mean like a loss, yeah, I knew like, it. you know, then you only have an issue with one or two devices. You can contact Ubiquity, let them know, right? They can fix the patch, push out the patch again, right? Um, but there's there's got to be some sort of thing. I mean, Chrome definitely has it right where, um, you know, nobody ever, I never have to patch Chrome. It just patches itself. I never have to worry about that. But, you know, part of the way they can do that is because they have a really robust test suite, right? Every time they make changes, they run tests, they are able to, capture crashes from their users and say, okay, this crashed, uh, you know, we need to fix this, or, uh, you know, this was probably a result of something we did and they can revert changes and push new patches and stuff. Uh, you know, vendors are going to have to start doing similar things and they're going to have to have good unit tests and good patch cycles. Oh, that's too funny. I just, uh, I'm giggling here because we got a, uh, this is not safe for work uh, from Laura in here. And I think that's, Hilarious. We tried warning. We can't help it. These scripts yeah. were terrible. Dropping F bombs yes. all over the place. Yeah, sorry. I, I sorry if you missed um if you missed the the uh, disclaimer. I did give a disclaimer earlier and said, Hey, look, you know, there's gonna be some cursing in here, not not because of us, but because of the names of the scripts and stuff. Uh, so I think you're just a foul mouth uh, hacker. Good for nothing yeah. and clear, clearly trying to get people in trouble at work. Gosh darn it. <laughs> So, uh, so, Chris, do we want to see if anybody, I mean, I think this is a, a right time to either allow people to ask questions or give feedback. Yeah. If somebody wants to try dialing in, I mean, we've kind of proved that this episode, almost everything is broken right now. People can't chat. We're using Twitter out of band comms. But if somebody wants to call yeah. in and kind of give maybe some testimony or thoughts or ask questions, this is the time it works. You literally just click the, um, you know, the call in, dial in seat button. Uh, that's here and yeah. you will show up and uh, be on the record. Yeah. Yeah. If you, if you have any questions about any of the scripts or, uh, you know, if anything that I was talking about wasn't clear, you know, please let me know and I'll, I'll try to uh, explain better. Oh, so uh, Laura wanted me to clarify since I did a poor, uh, poor job representing her. She was just kidding. She said she, you yeah. know, she kind of likes your foul mouth. JK, LOL. <laughs> Hashtag, sorry, not sorry. Sorry, not sorry. You're terrible. All right, so, so what can we, can we do? I think as a step forward, I think Internet of Things, and this is Kyle's opinion here, this is not going to be the last time we see this. Any Internet co uh, connected embedded device, I know we all joke about mm -hmm. your microwave, your refrigerator. This is going to happen. It's not going to be the last time. And unless your devices have some sort of auto patching that's outside of the user, especially the home user, I think we're doing ourselves a giant disservice to this internet of craziness that we're going to expect. Cause the reality is my mom is never going to patch her firewall. You know, she's never going to patch her right. microwave, you know, and get to the really extreme things. When we start talking about light bulbs and stuff like that, that are also going to have IPv6 connections. Nobody's going to patch that stuff. So uh, if right. we don't have some sort of built in fault tolerant patching network or patching system in place, um, I think we're going to see more and more of this. And stuff, worms yeah. like this, um, you know, we talked about it's cute. Somebody's dropping some F-bombs, changing the SSID names. But this could have been a capability for folks to be able to route traffic through these embedded devices. And if we talk about attribution being a pain, well, imagine being able to route, you know, whatever traffic through any ubiquity device under the sun and then trying to go back and right. say like, oh, it was this Spanish IP, uh, ISP that the guy originally complained from. It's surely not them doing it. Yeah. So. so I'm actually surprised and I wouldn't be I would not be surprised to see um, different variations of this come out uh, really soon. I mean, this was this one was pretty harmless. Right. <laughs> Change some SSIDs, drop some keys, 
blocked off the admin interface, but it could have been really a lot worse. Uh, you know, um, if they were, if they wanted to, they could have been really stealthy about it, drop binaries and did nothing. I mean, if you think about what these are attached to is general 